Another popular topic in cognitive psychology is mental imagery. So mental imagery is just like the representation in your mind of a sensory experience. And you can have mental images in any sensory system. So you can have visual mental images, auditory mental images, gustatory, olfactory, motor, tactile, pretty much any sensory system you can create mental images for. And that might sound a little confusing. It's like, well, I thought images were visual. And all I have to say about that is I didn't name it, okay? So it's unfortunate that we call it mental imagery because that implies that it's only a visual thing, when in reality, you can have mental images in any sense. Now, the, one of the most common research topics in mental imagery research is like, what's the point of mental imagery? Well, it really seems to be the case that mental imagery can be helpful when learning or maintaining certain kinds of motor skills. So by imagining yourself performing certain muscle movements, you can actually get better. Now, that definitely uh, provides even more support for that theory of grounded cognition that we talked about a few videos ago. So what that just is showing us is that when you imagine yourself performing these movements, you're actually activating the same brain areas that are responsible for actually performing those movements. So there's a lot of overlap in the neural networks. Nowadays, it seems pretty clear that mental images are picture-like. So they're like these images we have inside our brains of an object or an event. But even though they definitely seem to be picture-like, they aren't perfect. They're, they're like really poor pictures, you know? They're, they're not detailed, they're not vivid, they're kind of blurry, they're less colorful, and so on. So while they do have a lot in common with actual, uh, like, perception, they aren't generally as, you know, interesting. They aren't as detailed, and so on. But this whole idea that mental images are like perception is kind of a new idea. Uh, it's, of course, you know, people have been talking about it like that for, you know, centuries. But in psychological science, it's kind of new. Because for quite some time now, uh, for many, many decades now, uh, we've been talking about how the brain is similar to a computer. You know, in the, in the last you know, a few videos, I was talking about how we un the way we understand human memory comes from computer science. Well, the way we used to understand mental imagery also came from computer science. So what we used to think is that the brain works like a computer. You know, uh, whenever you imagine things, you're not actually looking at pictures or anything like that. You're just kind of reading something similar to computer code. You're reading a bunch of abstract symbols. And then based on the sequence of the symbols, that generates this idea of an image according to these abstract symbolic theories. And these were really popular. But like I said, because of recent research in the last couple decades, now the analog pictorial kinds of theories are much more popular. And these are the ones that say mental imagery is similar to perception. It's not about reading abstract computer code or whatever. My own research supports this idea. So let me show you an example of what one of my studies in mental imagery look like. All right, so in this experiment, what I had my participants do is, you know, just study these two patterns. So you see the one on the left, it's green horizontal pattern, and the one on the right is red vertical pattern. So when the experiment begins, every time you see the letter G, you should try to, as best as you can, imagine that green horizontal pattern just like you see it here. You just like draw it on the screen with your mind. And every time you see the letter R, imagine that red vertical pattern just as you see it here. Okay? So let's get started. 
So there's the letter G, so imagine those green horizontal lines as clear as you can right in the center of the screen. And there's a key. And now the letter R, imagine those red vertical lines as clear as you can in the center of the screen. And there's some disgusting garbage. Okay, so we would do that first phase of the experiment about 120 times. So you only experienced two trials, but my participants had to do a whole lot more. And if, if you were, um, if you think back to how learning works, if you think back to classical conditioning, then you probably understand what we're doing here. What we were doing is we were trying to associate the green horizontal pattern with happy, like pleasant things and the red vertical pattern with unpleasant things. But in general, the unpleasant things were much more unpleasant than the garbage you saw. Like we associated that red vertical pattern with pictures of gore and you know babies crying and just really kind of messed up stuff. So if the classical conditioning worked, if we were able to associate a mental image with actual perceptual stimulus, then that would provide clear evidence that mental imagery and perception are similar. And here's how we tested it. So after 120 trials of the training phase, now we go to the test phase. And for this, what my participants would have to do is make judgments as quick as they can by pushing keys on the keyboard. So they push one key for a pleasant picture and a different key for an unpleasant picture. So why don't you try to do that now. So as soon as you see a photograph, just make a decision. Is it pleasant or unpleasant? Okay, so that was a pleasant one. And there's another pleasant one. So they would do this test phase, just like what you saw here, about 240 times or something like that. And if you notice what we're doing here, what we're doing is actually priming. So right before you would see the photograph, you were shown either a green horizontal pattern or the red vertical pattern. And if the pattern matched the photograph in terms of how pleasant it is, then you should be faster to make your judgment. But if there was that mismatch, you know, with the red vertical and then the happy kitty, then that's actually going to slow you down because your initial response will be it's unpleasant because you remember we associated the red one with unpleasant things. So you start to make that kind of you know, judgment, but then you see the cat, and then you have to like, second guess yourself and change your response. And that's exactly what we found. We found that people were affected in that way. So we definitely got some classical conditioning for mental imagery. And that's kind of interesting. You know, that's kind of a big deal. And that definitely helps to you know, support this idea that mental imagery is similar to perception. Uh, the same basic brain areas are involved, except instead of, you know, information coming in from the body, you know, sensory information coming in and getting processed in the brain, now we have memories that are being processed in the brain in the same way. So it's just whether or not we're talking about incoming sensory information or memories. If during that experiment you had no idea what I was talking about and you didn't believe me for a second. It might be because you aren't the best mental imager. And there are definitely are differences between people in terms of their mental imagery ability. Some people are good imagers and some people are poor imagers. So this is the vividness of visual imagery questionnaire or the VVIQ. And this is something I would give to all my participants. So if you would like to see how good your visual imagery is, then you can participate. What you need to do is just try to imagine uh, a, a series of different you know, pictures in your head and then rate those pictures on a scale of one to five where five is perfectly clear and as vivid as real perception and one is no image at all. Okay, so I'm just going to describe a few different images and I want you to try to visualize them and then rate uh, how clear those visual images are. Alright, so for the first four, I want you to just 
pick a friend or a relative, somebody that you are very familiar with and you frequently see, but they're not with you right now. So just think of this person that you know and try to, as vividly as you can, imagine the exact contour of their face, head, shoulders, and body. So what does that person look like? All right. Now for the second one, try to imagine this friend's like characteristic poses of their head, the attitudes of their body, like just how they hold themselves, how do they like do they slouch, you know, do they stand up straight, like that kind of stuff. Just imagine how the person looks. All right, so for the third one, now imagine your friend is walking. Uh, what does that look like? Like, how do they move when they walk? What is their length of step? How fast do they walk? All right, and then number four is, now try to imagine the stereotypical kind of clothes the person wears. What are some, what are some of the colors that you tend to see that person wearing? Try to visualize those colors. Okay, so for the next four, now I want you to try to imagine that you are seeing a rising sun. So number five is you see the sun rising above the horizon into the hazy sky. Number six. The sky clears and surrounds the sun with blueness. Number seven, there's clouds, a uh, storm blows up, and there's flashes of lightning. Number eight, finally, a rainbow appears. Right. For the next four, just think of uh, a store that you go to frequently. So first, try to visualize, try to imagine what the store looks like as you are approaching it. So as you're walking towards the store, what does it look like? Okay. So now imagine that you've gotten close enough to the store to be able to like see in the windows and see what's for sale. But what kinds of displays, like what kinds of window displays does that store tend to have? Okay, so now you're at the entrance. Just try to visualize the shape, color, size, and all the other details regarding this entrance to the store. Like, what does that look like? Number 12 is you go into the store, uh, you, you pick up an object, and you go buy it at the counter. The counter assistant serves you, and you exchange some money. Can, can you visualize this kind of exchange of goods? And for the last four, I want you to think of a country scene that has trees and mountains and a lake. Just like a stereotypical country scene. So first, just imagine what the contours of the landscape would look like. Next, try to imagine the color and the shape of the trees. And now try to imagine the color and the shape of the lake. And then finally, imagine that there's a strong wind that blows on the trees and the lake and it causes waves. What would that look like? Okay, so now that you have rated each one of these mental images on a scale of one to five, you would basically just add up your score.
and that score will be out of 80. So the closer you are to 80, the better your mental imagery. And the minimum score you should have is 16. So you're going to be somewhere between 16 and 80. Now if you're somewhere in the middle, then I would say that's fairly normal. You know, most people are going to be able to create something like a mental image. But if you're at the extreme uh, low end or the extreme sh high end, then you're definitely, you know, a weirdo. It's not very common for people to be able to create mental images that are either, you know, almost indistinguishable from reality or non-existent. My score would be right about here. So I'm probably a little bit on the low end, but definitely still in that middle area. So there's a couple more things I'd like to say about mental imagery, and that is you can create mental images or you can simply retrieve stored mental images. So what I mean by s stored images is just you think back to previous experiences, you think back to previous events or objects that you have seen and you just try to remember what they look like. So this is the common way that we use mental imagery, is just kind of trying to remember what things look like or sounded like or smelled like and so on. So we're just retrieving these stored memories. But you can also create mental images. Now the thing about creating mental images is that you can't create them from scratch. You have to have something to work with. In other words, when you create a mental image, you're actually just kind of combining stored images in interesting ways. Um, a, a really good example of this would be, you know, for example, a, a chimera. If you know what a chimera is, it's a mythical creature. It contains aspects of many animals all kind of combined in a really interesting way. Like it typically has the wings of a falcon, the body of a lion, the horns of a goat, and maybe even uh, a snake for a tail. So it's just really kind of interesting when you start piecing together your stored mental images in creative ways. Now, some researchers would argue that mental imagery is basically the same thing as hallucination, but I think that's erroneous, simply because hallucinations are oftentimes confused with reality. You know, a hallucination is when you think you're hearing voices, and those voices seem real. Well, the reason why that's different is because you don't ever really uh, trick yourself like that when you're simply imagining things. So when you're imagining things, it's pretty obvious that it's not real, you know, because remember, mental imagery generally is not as vivid as real perception, whereas hallucination definitely is. The last thing I wanted to talk about is synesthesia. Now, I don't really consider synesthesia to be a kind of mental imagery, but many researchers would argue that that is the case. So let me just tell you what it is. It is the rare ability to create mental images that cross normal sensory barriers. In other words, it's when seeing the, the color red makes you smell something specific, or hearing a certain tone makes you see certain kinds of color. So some of the most common kinds of this kind of cross-sensory perception is called grapheme color synesthesia. That's one of the most common. And that's when you see certain letters and or numbers as having a particular color. So for example, you would always see the letter A as being red, and the letter B is blue, and the letter C is green, or something like that. So for you, it doesn't matter what the color of the font actually is, you always see it in that color, because that letter has become linked with that color in some strange way. But there's a couple other forms of synesthesia as well. You could see particular colors when you hear certain musical notes, or maybe you'll even actually see words that you hear. So when somebody's speaking to you, it's almost like you have subtitles. It's like your, your life has subtitles. And if that sounds totally bizarre, it is because people with synesthesia are extremely rare. 